Evening, everybody. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Our text is just going to be one verse out of Isaiah 40. While you're turning there, I want to read the scripture to you. This is 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. And Paul says this. He says, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Now he mentions three things. He says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I got to think about those three words. And I am thankful for all three of those aspects of gospel preaching. I am thankful for preaching that reproves me, that convicts me. That's what that means. Preaching that reminds me that I am nothing but a sinner in the hands of a holy and a sovereign God. And this is necessary because we have high and lofty thoughts of ourselves. We're filled with self-righteousness. We're filled with pride. And that's a problem. Listen to what the Proverbs say, Proverbs 16 18. It says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. You leave me without reproof. You leave me without conviction. I'll have this high and lofty thoughts of myself that leads me to destruction. It's best I stay down in the dirt where I belong. I'm thankful for preaching that rebukes me, that corrects me. You think of that, uh, the word repentance. You know what that means. It means a change of mind. We have to constantly brought back to repentance, constantly have our minds changed because the way we naturally think about who God is and how he saves sinners and who we are and how we fit in this equation, it's all wrong. I have to be constantly reminded my natural thoughts are wrong. And if I want to know who God is, there's only one place I can go. It's right here. It's this book. And if it comes from this book and this book says it, I must believe it. It's an issue of life and death. And if this book does not say it, it's error. It's wrong. That's it. I want to be rebukable. I want to be correctable. I'm thankful for that preaching. I'm thankful for preaching that exhorts me, that calls me to action. This is Barnabas speaking to the church in Antioch in Acts 11:23. 23. He says, Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, and with purpose of heart, that they would cleave to the Lord. Now, there is nothing I find more thrilling on this earth then when a man gets up here and he tells me that not only as a sinner that I have a right to believe, to cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ and His work and Him alone, but that I am a commanded to. It is my job. I am commanded to do that. I'm not just welcome. I am commanded to, to not do His disobedience. I love that type of preaching. I'm thankful for that type of preaching. But if there's an aspect of gospel preaching that I'm most thankful for, it is found in Isaiah 40, verse 1. Look at verse 1. The commandment to the prophet is this, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. If there's an aspect of gospel preaching that I am most thankful for, it's preaching that comforts me. Preaching that reminds me that there is peace between me and my God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching that tells me that there is nothing left for me to do. Christ did it all. Absolutely nothing left for me to do. It's all been done, and I have one responsibility in all this. That's it. And it's to do nothing, absolutely nothing. Just rest. Just sit there and trust Christ. He took care of it all. That's my favorite. That brings me comfort. Now, when I was looking at this concept of comfort in the Scriptures, I came across three different characters in the Old Testament. And in three different stories, there's a portion of the story that seems to center around this thing of comfort, one with Noah and one with Joseph and one with Ruth. And I want to look at that tonight. We're going to look at six comforting thoughts. But before we do that, before we dive into that, we have to remain true to the text. And what it says in Isaiah 40 is this, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. My people. The message of comfort is not for everyone. It's not for every man. I think it was, I heard Henry Mahan say this, he goes, we cannot comfort where the Lord is not already comfort. We cannot speak peace to a man that has no peace. If a man has no peace with God... If God is still angry with him, if there's still a war between him and God, we would do damage by speaking peace to that man. So we must identify who are these people who the Lord says, you comfort these people. Speak comfortably to them. I'm going to give you a scripture here. I want to make this as simple as I can. Revelation 17, 14 says this. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are three things. They are called, and they are chosen, and they are faithful. They're chosen. 
Ephesians 1.4 tells us this, that before the world began, God the Father elected, He chose a people, and He chose them for one reason, unto salvation for this reason, because of their connection with Jesus Christ, His Son. Because they were in Christ, because God is eternal, Jesus Christ is eternal, He has no beginning and He has no end. His people, they have no beginning, they have no end. They have always been in Him, connected to Him. And in looking at His Son, God the Father said, I choose Him. He's the one who has all my delight. He's the one I love. He's the one I choose. And when He chose Christ, He chose everybody in Christ. That's what Ephesians 1 4 told us, that they're chosen before the world ever began. They're called in this life. At one point, they did not believe. At one point, they do. At one point in this life, they're born, they're dead. At one point, they're given life. It's when they're called, when God the Holy Spirit calls them. It's always a call, though, to come down. Remember Zacchaeus? The Lord came to him where he was at. He was high. He was up in a tree. And the Lord said this, come down. And with absolutely no hesitation whatsoever, this is the way it always works, that man came down. And that's the call. It's always to come down. Come down from those high and lofty thoughts about trying to save yourself, trying to justify yourself by your works in front of this holy God. You come down from all that and you take your rightful place as a sinner down the dust in front of a sovereign. Come down. They're called. And they're faithful. They're faithful. The object of their faith is this one singular person. It is Jesus Christ. And they are recipients of faith. They didn't come up with this faith. They didn't muster it on their own. They are recipients. And that faith, it has one singular object. It's Christ and Him crucified alone. That's their only hope. That's God's people. But let me narrow it down even further. It says this, 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. You can write this down anywhere you want. Say it every single day. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now that's God's people right there. A sinner, a poor and needy man who is solely looking to Jesus Christ. His, his eggs are all in this one basket. He has one place to look and that's Christ and he has no claims on God. And if you can answer that name, a sinner... You're one of God's people. That means tonight you are to be comforted. And I pray the Lord would do that. Let's get into it. Go to Genesis chapter 5. Let's look at Noah. Remember when we look at these characters, we're looking for comfort. Genesis chapter 5 and look at verse 28. It says, And Lamech lived an hundred and eighty-two years, and begat a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. Now when Adam disobeyed God, when he ate the fruit, and he disobeyed God, the ground was cursed. The earth was cursed because of Adam's disobedience. Let me read this to you. It's from Genesis 3, verse 17. God speaking to Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Now I find this interesting. When Adam fell, when Adam disobeyed God and he fell, it was not just Adam and all his posterity and the entire human race that was defiled. The entire creation was defiled. The whole world came under God's curse. Here's an interesting story. Macy was telling me this the other day. So we have a dog named Rosie, right? The Cyphers, they have a dog named Lucy. And Macy said that they got the dogs together and they got two bowls, identical bowls, and they filled both the bowls with dog food, right? Exact same dog food, exact same amount. And the dogs come up to it, and you know what they did? They went for each other's bowls. Because they were afraid the other dog would have something they didn't. They were jealous of the other dog's food, so they went to the other bowls. The entire creation is defiled. The ground was defiled. When Adam was in the garden, he was there to dress and keep the garden. It was easy. The ground had just the right amount of minerals. It got just enough sunlight. There was just enough water. But now he was cast out of the garden. The ground was hard, and it was rocky, and he was untillable. And so somebody says, what, though, is this talking about? What do you mean here? Because it says in the text that he's going to comfort them concerning the toil of their hands in regards to the ground that the Lord cursed. Speaking of agriculture, what, what, what are they talking about here? I have no idea. I read a bunch of commentaries on this, and if you'd like to laugh a little bit, read them because this is funny. One guy surmised that because uh, Noah was a husbandman and he created a vineyard when he got off the ark, that he probably developed a new agriculture tool. 
and maybe he was the first guy to develop the shovel. Now, there was over 1,500 years between Adam and Noah, so that would have meant for 1,500 years people were digging in the dirt. Nobody thought about taking a stick and putting a rock on the end of it. What I am sure of is that that is not the point. The point is this. When Adam sinned against God, the whole creation fell under the curse. Adam fell under the curse. That upright and righteous nature he had, he lost it. He took on a sinful and an evil nature, and he passed that down to every one of us after that. And we can read about that, and we're going to Galatians chapter 3. Turn over there. Let's read about this curse that we've come under in Adam. Galatians chapter 3, and I want you to pick up in verse 10. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now stop there for a second. I greatly appreciate when a man stands up here and he preaches to me and he starts preaching about God's electing grace, the election of God, His sovereignty and salvation. I greatly appreciate that when he speaks of that. He also gives me the markers that I might know that I'm one of those people. And those markers are very simple. I am a sinner, and Christ is my only hope. And if you check both those boxes, be assured you are elect. You are chosen of God. You are one of God's people. I am thankful for that. But what are the markers of a man that is under God's curse? We just read it. For as many as are of the works of the law. How can a man know if he's under God's curse? He's under the works. He's of the works of the law. He believes there is something good about him. He believes there is a shot that he could do something that could please God. There is a shot that he could stand before God and he can say, I did this, and the Lord would turn to him and say, yes, I'll accept that. And he's willing to take that shot. He's willing to go on that because if he does, there's some personal glory in it for him, and that's what he wants. If you want to know a man who's under the curse of God, he's of the law. Now, anyone who's interested in coming on those grounds, standing on the grounds of the law, I've done this, now have mercy. I want you to understand what you're getting yourself into. Read verse 10. We're going to read the whole thing. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you will come on the grounds of the law, grounds of your own obedience to the law, you will say, Lord, have mercy on me because I done something according to the law. You are a debtor to do the law. All things. That's what the law demands. Every jot, every tittle, inwardly and outwardly, your entire life. Now, what's the success rate of this? What is the success rate of men coming to God on the basis of their own works and finding acceptance? Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. What's the success rate here of men coming to God on the basis of their own works? No man. Zero. Been tried time and time again in every generation. It hasn't worked yet. Every single time they, they've heard, depart from me. I never knew you. I think it's interesting here that Paul says it's evident. That no man is justified by the law. It is evident. Why is that evident? I'll give you three reasons. Number one, because the scriptures declare it. You look at this book, one of the major themes of this book is this, is that God can have absolutely nothing to do with a sinful man. He cannot accept anything that comes from a sin sinful man. Read this book over and over and over that's in there. You remember King Uzziah. King Uzziah lifted up with pride. He comes into the temple. He bypasses the priest. He says, I no longer need a go-between between between me and God. He offers strange incense. The Lord kills him right there. Strikes him as a leper and kills him right there. Why? Because he can have absolutely nothing to do with a sinful man. He bypassed the priest. He bypassed the intercessor. Second reason that is evident. Because there is no difference between men. I want you to think of yourself for a second. Do you have any hope of standing before a holy and a sovereign God based on how you conducted yourself in this world? Is there any hope that you will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, standing on the grounds of your own obedience? If you're a believer, the answer is no. And because there is no difference between men, because it will not work for you, it won't work for any man either. It is evident. 
And the third reason is this, that it's evident. Because of the character of God. God is holy. Absolutely 100% holy. He can have absolutely nothing to do with sin. That's it. Now, if a man can't be justified by the law, what is he supposed to do? Look at verse 11 again. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Do you want to live? Do you want to live? Only one way. You look to Christ. You abandon that law. You get away from this thing of trying to justify yourself before the law, before a holy God, and you believe. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way. And if there are any questions about the mingling of law and faith, look at verse 12. It says, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now perhaps you've heard somebody say this, I've done my best and Christ did the rest. And so what they're saying is, I'm relying on the merits and the efforts of Jesus Christ in some way, but I have also made my contribution. It's a mingling there. Well, the law is not of faith. Can't have it both ways. If you'll come on the grounds of your own obedience at all, your own contributions, you are a debtor to do the whole law. The law doesn't care anything about your faith. Vice versa. If you're truly a believer, if you truly are looking to Christ alone, you want absolutely nothing to do with that old law. That law does nothing but convict you and condemn you before a holy God. You want nothing to do with it. The law is not of faith. Now, someone may say, you promised in the beginning of this there would be comfort. So where's comfort in all this? Verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Here's the first comforting thought, that Christ hath redeemed you from the curse of the law. Now, the law demanded two things from you. Number one, it demanded that you be punished for breaking it. The Lord Jesus Christ was made a curse for you. He went to the cross bearing your sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, 4, 21, For he hath made him sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the very righteousness of God in him. Because he became your curse, and he bore the shame of that curse, and he bled and died bearing that curse. You bear that curse no more. And now the law says, I'm satisfied. He's been punished. He was punished in the person of his Redeemer. I am satisfied right there. I've got nothing to say to him. The other thing the law demanded from you was this, that you keep it. You couldn't just be neutral. You couldn't just be without sin. You have to actually be righteous. The Lord Jesus Christ took care of that too. When he lived that perfect life, when he honored God's law and he believed his Father and he did his Father's will every single time, he developed and he created the righteousness, the very righteousness of the saints. It says this in Jeremiah 33, 16, and this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now, Turn over to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. Pick up at verse 21. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. Genesis 50 verse 21. Joseph said to his brothers, Now therefore fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now what's going on here? What's the backstory? Jacob is dead. He died in Egypt next to Joseph and his brothers. And Joseph's brothers start to get a little anxious. They're afraid that Joseph is now going to exact revenge on them. You remember what they did. Back way back when Joseph was a young man, they sold him to slavery. And they told Jacob, their father, he's dead. No reason to think about him anymore. He's dead. He's gone. And then Joseph lived a very rough life. He was in Potiphar's house for a while until Potiphar's wife lied on him. He's thrown into prison. And he goes through all these series of calamities and life of ups and downs like every other believer until finally there's a famine in the land of Egypt. And he is promoted to where he is the second in command, second to only Pharaoh in Egypt. And he has developed a way to feed everybody around the land. Not just the Egyptians, but everybody else. And he is Pharaoh's second in command. And his brothers come to the land. And he recognizes his brothers, and he forgives them. Now let's pick up reading. Go to verse 15. Let's find out what happens. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, 
and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto the evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass that it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them. Two things. Here's a comforting thought. God is absolutely nothing like you and me. Why did Joseph's brothers think that he was going to exact revenge on them? Because that's exactly what they would have done. They got together and said, listen, we got to do something about this. Our dad's dead, and the only reason he hasn't killed us yet is because of dad, right? And he's gone, and we've got to do something here. And the reason they thought that way is because if he would have done that to them, that is exactly what they would have done. They would have waited until Jacob was dead, and they would have killed him. How many times have we sinned? I'm talking about walking into it eyes wide open, knew what we was doing was wrong, we did it anyway, and we stood back and said, that's it, he's going to destroy me. He's going to utterly wipe me out, there's no more mercy for me, he's going to get rid of me, that's the end of it. How many times have you and I thought that? Why do we think that way? Because that's exactly how we would be. If we were God, give us a little while. We might be merciful for a little while. We might let a man offend against us a few times. We might even let a guy we like offend against us a lot. But eventually we would get fed up. A man would shake his fist in our, in our face enough. And we would wipe everyone else. And no one would be saved. God is absolutely nothing like you and me. He says this in Psalm 50, 21. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But he is not. Now, he's especially not like us in this respect. His mercy and his grace are inexhaustible. Now, I want you to turn over to Psalm 86. I want to show you something. Psalm 86, and look at verse 5. It says, For thou, Lord are good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Now, if you look in this psalm, the concept of mercy is mentioned four times in this psalm. If you look down in verse 16, it says this, David speaking, O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about sovereign mercy. If a man will have mercy... It's for one reason, one reason alone, because God sovereignly will turn unto that man. Long before that man is ever even conscious that he knows he needs mercy, God must turn to him with an eye of love and an eye of mercy and say, I will have mercy on this man. I will have mercy to whom I will have mercy. To whom I will, he will not. It's sovereign mercy. Look at verse 13. David says, for great is thy mercy toward me. What makes the mercy of God so great? It's this, because it demands absolutely nothing of the recipient. It doesn't look to the recipient for the reason to show that mercy. Also this for this reason. Because it is conditional. It is conditioned on God's justice being met. And when the Lord is merciful to a man is for this reason. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has put away that man's sin. And so when that mercy is shown it honors God's justice. He is being merciful to him essentially because there is nothing to be mad at him about. It's great mercy. But twice in the scripture it says it is Plenteous in mercy, verse 5 and verse 15. As if to say, if there's one thing you want to stress, you want to drive home, give it double emphasis, this thing of plenteous mercy. So let me emphasize it as I should. This is almost a cliche statement, but I'll say it. The Lord is more willing to show you mercy than you are to receive it. It is plenteous mercy. It's like a river that keeps on flowing and flowing and flowing to his people. You could never drink it dry. You can never send it away. It keeps on flowing and flowing. It's like storehouses full of grain. Just eat. Just eat. You'll never run out. It's plenteous mercy to all that call upon it. Here's a second comforting thought here. The favor that you have with the Father is completely based on your connection with someone else. In this story we have 
in Genesis 50, what his brothers do this, what Joseph's brothers are doing is this. They're sending Joseph a message, and they're saying, this is from Jacob. And what Jacob said is, you're supposed to forgive us. What's interesting about that is, this is the only time in Scripture that that's recorded. It's never recorded that Jacob actually told his brothers to say this. It could be that these boys are just making this up because they think this. If we ask him to forgive us, he probably won't do it because we sinned against him. But if he thinks Jacob said, forgive us, he'll do it for Jacob's sake. Why does the Lord forgive us? It is completely and utterly for Christ's sake because of our connection with someone else, with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a difference between Joseph's brothers and us, and it's this. Joseph's brother's hope was on the words of a man who is a dead. Our hope of forgiveness rests on the words of a man who is alive. Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, when he gave up the ghost, his body was placed in a sepulcher, and it remained there three days. He was dead. And on the third day, you know what happened? He brought himself back to life. He did that for this reason, because the justice of God would not allow him to be dead anymore, because the sin was paid. All the sin, all the curse that was put upon him that he was made, he put all that away, and the justice of God could no longer allow him to be dead. He had to be raised from the dead. And how does he spend his time now being raised from the dead? He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he makes intercession for all his people. And here's the difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and Jacob. Jacob said, overlook them. They sinned against you, but you overlooked them. Christ says, look them over. Look them over. You will find absolutely nothing amiss in them. As long as I'm alive, as long as I'm righteous, as long as I'm holy, they are the, the exact same way. Don't overlook them. Look them over. Accept them because I've made them acceptable. Forgiveness is because of your connection with somebody else. All right, turn over to Ruth chapter 2. Y'all are familiar with this book. It focuses on three people. You have Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer. You have Naomi, and you have her daughter-in-law, Ruth. That's who in this book. Here's what happens. Naomi's heading back with Ruth. They're heading back to Judah. That's where they're from originally. Naomi has lost her husband. He's dead. She's lost her children, her sons. They're dead. And she's lost all her wealth. And here's the only hope for Naomi and Ruth. That's it. There's a law in the books in Judah. It's the law of the kinsman redeemer. It's basically this. If you have a near kinsman, bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, and he is able and he is willing and you've lost everything, he can bring back, he can restore everything you had and bring you back to where you were before. And their only hope is Boaz. Now, pick up in verse 13. Let's we'll see what happened. This is Ruth gleaning in Boaz's field. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. Well, what did Boaz say to her that was so comforting? Look at verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my, ma my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go on the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now I have three comforting observations from what we just read. And the first thing is this. Not only was Ruth welcome in Boaz's field, she was commanded never to leave. Now I told you at the beginning of this message if there's anything I love hearing that gives my heart more joy, it is this. That not only am I welcome with the Lord Jesus Christ, that I am to believe on Him. I am commanded to believe on Him, to come and to never leave. Don't go to another field. Now, in Luke 18, there's a situation that happens between the Lord and His disciples. These people are bringing these infants to the Lord Jesus Christ. They bring these infants to Him. And somebody asked, well, what did He want them to do? Why would, why would someone bring their infant to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I have no idea, but if he was here right now and I had an infant, I'd bring him to him too.
because the best place anybody could possibly be is near him. Only makes sense. But the disciples rebuked them. They said, don't, don't bring these people, don't bring these children to our Lord. And here's what he said. He said, but Jesus called them unto him and said, suffer little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God. If you have the dependency level of a child, of a small infant, you can't do anything for yourself. Everything has to be done for you. Then he suffers you. Come to me. Believe on me. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's not good advice, and that is not a suggestion. That is a command. Not only was she welcome in Boaz's field, don't leave. Don't go to another field. Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You've tasted of the grain. Boaz took her out. He said, Ruth, look here. Everything you need, it's right here for you. Right? You've tasted of the grain. You've tasted the water. You've found shade underneath the trees. Don't go anywhere else. Don't go back to the wall. You've tasted of Christ. You've tasted of the sweetness of His grace. Don't go back to the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the law. Don't try to justify yourself based on something you did. Don't leave this field. Not only was she welcome there, and she was commanded not to leave, in this field, Ruth found everything she needed. Boy, I said, here, here's what we got, all right? My workers here, as they pick up the corn, the grain, and they're carrying it off, they're going to leave some handfuls of purpose. That's how he describes it in another place. Handfuls of purpose. They're going to drop some on the ground right there for you. So when you're hungry, you don't have to till the ground. You don't have to plant the crops. I've already done it all. Go pick it up. It's right there for you. When you get thirsty, you go over here. There's water. You don't even have to draw the water. The young men have already done it. You get tired, go up to the house. Go under a shade tree, take a nap. Everything here is provided for you. You don't have to do a thing, Ruth. Everything you need, it's right here in my field. Everything you need is in Christ. This is Colossians 2, verse 9. says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you, the Lord's people, you're complete. Complete in Him. In what ways? 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of Him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You lack absolutely nothing. Everything you need in this field, this field of Christ. I was thinking about that thing of no lack. And I started thinking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. You remember when the manna, that bread from heaven, it would rain down. Remember what they were supposed to do? You go gather it in the morning, right? Every man according to his eating. But you know what? Everybody gathered according to their eating, but everybody ate the same thing. They all ate an omer, a single unit of measure. Let me read this to you. Exodus 16 and 18. It says, And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So if you were a young, strong man, right, you'd go out there and you'd gather all this manna up. And when you came out to have it meted out to you, to have it measured, you know how much you got? You got an omer. That's it. And you know what you were with an omer? You were satisfied. You were 100% satisfied. You had absolutely no lack whatsoever. And you know what? If you were an old crippled widow and you had health problems, she could go up. Maybe she could just pick up a few pieces, right? And she'd come back and she'd have it meted out to her. It would be measured and she'd be lacking, right? No, her cup was filled up. You want to know why? That young guy who brought in all the bounty, they filled her cup up with his. And you know what she got? She got an omer, right? And she ate and she was satisfied. Everybody ate the same thing and everybody was satisfied. Now in this field, in Christ, some are recipients of great faith. And if you have that, I'm thankful that you have that. Never move. Great faith. Some are recipients of weak faith. Constantly worried, constantly scared. But you know what? In this field, in Christ, everybody gets the exact same thing. And everybody is satisfied because it ain't the strength of the faith. It's the object. Last comforting thought. In Christ, nothing can touch you. In verse 9, Boaz says this. He says, Have I not charged thee men that they shall not touch you? I want to close by reading Romans 8, in verse 35. Nothing shall touch us in Christ. Romans 8, look at verse 35. 
Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or pale or, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now I find it interesting, these things that Paul mentions here, tribulation, distress, persecution. The world would say a man who's experienced these things, God's hand is against him. God must hate this man if he's going through persecution, distress, and sword, and all these different things. He must hate him, right? Couldn't be further for the truth for the believer. The Lord says this, Hebrews 12, 6, he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son he receiveth. The trials and tribulation we experience, and we do, we are killed all the day long. In this life is just a series of trial and tribulation coming in and out of it the entire time. Killed all day long. But you know what? It is not the sign the Lord's hand is against us, that he does not love us. It is a sign of sonship. It is a sign that the Lord actually does love us because he scourges, he chastens every son he receives. Look at verse 38. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and the love of the Father. Not our sin. Lord, save us from our sin. Keep us from doing that which we would do, as terrible as it was yesterday, and as terrible as it was today, and Lord, help us what we're going to do tomorrow. For your sin will never separate you from the love of God. Because those sins are paid for sins. Your unbelief. We believe, but we've caveated with this. Help thou my unbelief. Right? You are saved by a faith. You are justified by a faith, but it ain't yours. You are saved and you are justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Him honoring his father, him doing exactly what his father told him to do. That's why you're saved. Your faith believes that. Your unbelief won't keep you from the love of God. Not apathy, not cold heartedness, not lack of zeal. These things are terrible, absolutely horrible, and they're inexcusable. And none of them will separate you from the love of God and Jesus Christ. None of them will separate you from the love of the father. You want to know why? Because the father's love is all in Jesus Christ. As long as Jesus Christ is acceptable and lovable to the father, so are you, because you share that union with him. And you will never be separated from the love of Jesus Christ for this reason. In loving you, he is loving himself. And he cannot deny himself. That's six comforting thoughts. I'm going to leave you all there.